Order. The sitting is resumed and it's time for questions to the Minister of the Environment. We start with listed questions and I call Mr Barry Michael Duff. Uh, question number one, Cash Duvery here. The mandatory minimum learning period to which the member refers is part of a package of measures contained within the Road Traffic Amendment Bill. The combination of these measures, often referred to as Graduated Driver Licensing or GDL, has been designed to provide new drivers with experience and skills over time in lower risk environments. Integral to any such scheme is a mandatory learning period within which learner drivers follow a prescribed programme of training. The Bill, as introduced to the Assembly, makes provision for a 12-month mandatory learning period. The rationale of this period is to encourage provisional license holders to focus on learning to drive and not simply passing the practical driving test. The mandatory learning period provides learners with time to take additional training, to practice and to gain experience on a variety of roads, traffic environments and weather and light conditions. By gaining this experience throughout the year and during the different seasons and associated weather and light conditions, drivers become better prepared for solo driving after passing the test. The minimum period also accounts for differences in learning ability, which a specific number of lessons cannot address. New drivers are overrepresented in fatal and serious collisions. Over the period 2008 to 2012, our drivers, who account for less than 1% of license holders, were responsible for 7% of fatalities and serious injuries. I want to encourage drivers to gain experience before they drive unaccompanied. It is this experience of real life driving with the benefit of a supervising driver which the mandatory learning period seeks to encourage. The bill is currently at committee stage and I look forward to hearing the committee's views on the full range of provisions. I call Mr. Michael Duff for a supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his uh, answer and I certainly take on board the last point he made about road safety you know, being paramount in all of this. But can I ask the Minister to outline his department's thinking on evidence which is coming forward from the Ulster Farmers Union and driving instructors, which suggests that the driving test should be not about age but about driver ability and the point that's being made often is that young people from a farming background may be ready for the test sooner than 12 months after they secure their provisional license. and thank Mr McAdoff for the question and supplementary. The purpose of committee stage is to consult and I value input from any organisation and any individual that will improve this bill and that will improve road safety. And the organisations to which uh, Mr Michael Duff refers, the Ulster Farmers Union and, of course, approved driving instructors, are most valued by myself and will certainly inform us going forward. The contention, however, that rural drivers or someone from a farming background will be better equipped for driving on the road merely because they have been driving a tractor from a younger age is one that unfortunately doesn't stand up to scrutiny. The sad reality is that the majority of serious uh, injuries on our roads or uh, collisions that result in fatalities occur on rural roads some 80% of collisions. In fact, I believe that the points that Mr. Michael Duff is making, or sorry, echoing those of the approved driving instructors and the, the UFU are good ones though. They're not ones that I will ignore. I, the bill as presented is not, in my opinion, the bill that will finally pass through this house. I'm prepared to accept amendments to it. I'll possibly bring forward amendments to it myself, all with a view to making a bill that is workable and a bill that works to reduce fatalities and reduce injuries on our roads. Thank you. I call Lord Morrow. Principal Deputy Speaker, 
I'd like to ask the minister, does he feel that one driving test in a lifetime is adequate, bearing in mind how the volume of traffic is changing virtually, certainly annually, but it seems there's more and more and more traffic on our roads nearly daily. Is a single driving test adequate for a lifetime? And I thank Lord Morrow uh, for his question. The point that uh, Lord Morrow makes is one that has been made before, and again, certainly one that would warrant further exploration, in my opinion. When we talk about road safety, it's not just about drivers and fitness of people to drive, but look at how we assess fitness of vehicles on the road and their roadworthiness. Vehicles have to be tested after four years and then every one year thereafter. So people might quite sensibly ask, if someone passes their driving test age 17 or 18, should they not be uh, examined for 70 years thereafter or however long uh, they, they may be lucky enough to be able to re remain behind a wheel. Then if you look at our professional drivers, as you might call them, such as HGV drivers or even taxi drivers, the, the taxi legislation with which Lord Morrow is very uh, familiar brings in new training for drivers on an annual basis to ensure that their standards of driving remain extremely high. And people, again, might ask, should ordinary drivers have to do continued professional or continued development, if you like, in that respect as well? I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, Ministers just said you know, the rationale for this legislation is to improve road safety, particularly targeting young people. And some organisations during giving evidence would question the Minister's logic for lowering the age of learner drivers now to 16 and a half, and I would like his comment on that. And also uh, the question about us being then out of sync with the rest of the UK and the Republic of Ireland for a younger learner driver when you know they are driving across the border or to other parts of the UK. Also, the fact that now the, the also yes, it's the same question about lowering the age of learner drivers. What is the impact going to be on insurance premiums? Thank you. Uh, I got a few desk I thank uh, Ms. Lowe for her questions. <laughs> uh, she's probably quite right in that people given the evidence to the committee are questioning my logic. It's not just people who appear before committees in this place that, that, that question my logic or, or the logic of, of many others. And here, this issue of reducing the age at which someone can uh, start learning, however, is something of a red herring. The impact on the minimum learning period on increasing the full licensing age is limited to 17 and a half, which this legislation also does, is limited by the fact that provision is made within the Road Traffic Amendment Bill to reduce the provisional age, as Ms Lowe has pointed out, to 16 and a half. Recent figures demonstrate that the number of people currently achieving a full licence prior to 17 and a half years of age is limited. It is estimated that around 540 persons aged under 17 and a half currently hold a restricted or R plate driving licence or have passed the test and not yet applied for their licence. This represents some 4.4 per cent of the population in that category. The fact that if we allow people to start learning at 16 and a half and introduce the mandatory minimum learning period of one year, people won't be on the roads until 17 and a half. And as I've highlighted through uh, those statistics that they gave, currently there are people driving before they reach 17 and a half years of age. There is the old adage that if you're good enough you're old enough. However, evidence from other jurisdictions uh, to which Ms Lowe refers shows that with age does come responsibility. 
and a reduction in the likelihood of involvement in collisions. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question to My department has a statutory duty to pay special attention to the desir desirability of preserving or enhancing the character or appearance of conservation areas under Article 55 of the Planning Northern Ireland Order 1991. The department has planning officers with particular expertise in conservation matters and their advice is sought in relation to development proposals which may impact upon a conservation area. This advice is one of a number of considerations taken into account when reaching a planning decision. Mm -hmm. The Department must give full regard to all material considerations, including the policy guidance set down within Planning Policy Statement 6, Planning, Archaeology and the Built Heritage, Chapter 7, the advice and guidance in the relevant conservation area document to which the proposal relates, the relevant development plan, consultee responses, council views, objections and any other representations made. Thank you. And I call Mr Jerry Kelly for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for the answer up to now. And I know this is not a new uh, question to put to him. And he, uh, quoted Article 55 and said that uh, full regard had to be taken by the department. Is there any notion, because the, out there the idea or the view is that uh, planning just ignore these reports and obviously they cost a lot of money, does he have any notion that he could uh, strengthen uh, the power of the conservation officers uh, through legislation or through some other way so that their reports actually do have an impact because the experience both in council and it's been raised many times here is that, is that they are ignored? Uh, thank uh, Mr Kelly for that supplementary question. First of all, let me assure Mr Kelly and the House that these reports are not ignored, however it may seem, and, and believe me, I have heard concerns that they are ignored, or that sufficient weight, shall we say, is not always, if even not often, attached uh, to them. As I've said, the report of a conservation officer is a material consideration that must be balanced with other material considerations uh, with each application. Each application is unique and each application is assessed on its own merits or otherwise. As regards to the strengthening of this policy or perhaps giving more weight than is currently given uh, to conservation officer reports. The member will be aware, as will other members, particularly those on the Environment Committee, that uh, work on the strategic planning policy statement is well underway. We have had over 700 responses to the consultation on the draft. SPPS, uh, a summary of those responses went to committee just last week or the week before. and Myself and my officials are currently working through them. This SPPS isn't and shouldn't be, in my opinion, merely a consolidation of existing planning policy statements, but is, in my opinion, a great opportunity to improve planning policy statements. Uh, the issues around conservation will be in the mix therein, and I will also look to see how and if this particular element can be improved. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I thank the Minister for his answer. In the context of uh, what uh, he has referred to, uh, in North Belfast we have um, uh, a very old part of the city, Clifton Street, involving uh, Clifton House, a very historic building. Uh, we've got also the Grand Orange Lodge as well there, a former headquarters. Um, of the Orange Lodge in, in uh, Belfast. And also, in addition to that, we have other historic buildings such as St. Patrick's Church and also maybe the Irish News. I don't know if that's historic or not. Uh, but, <laughs> 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 but in that context, what, what is, how would the Minister um, 
uh, prevent uh, an adverse impact on the development of student accommodation in that area uh, that might feed the, uh, the student population of uh, the new University of Ulster buildings in that area. Gourmet, I've got a few less concordia and I thank uh, Mr McGuinness, not just for the supplementary question but also for the virtual tour of the north <laughs> of Belfast. Uh, uh, well, I am committed to ensuring that my department plays its full role in ensuring that the provision of student accommodation has no detrimental impact on either the built heritage or indeed on the amenity of local communities. In order to achieve this and maximise the benefits associated with investment in the area of North Belfast, and there have been quite a there has been quite a lot of publicity around proposals and potential proposals uh, in your constituency. I have asked my department to explore options to develop a comprehensive approach to this form of development. However, I must also recognise that we take full account of the statutory planning process, which will include BMAP and policies contained within the HMO uh, subject plan. I recently met with the Mayor. Of, of Belfast, Nicola Mallon, with concerns that she had, or sorry, that the council had with regard to some of these uh, proposals and potential proposals and their impact, not just on the built heritage, but also on the amenity of local communities, as I said. And I believe a holistic approach to uh, assessing and dealing with these applications is necessary to ensure that the right and appropriate balance is struck between built heritage and, as I say, the economic benefits that can come and should come to those local communities with investment in this area. Thank you. And question three has been withdrawn and uh, a written response will issue. Can I call Mr Tom Elliott? Okay. Question number four, Principal Deputy Speaker. I am committed to ensuring that the protections for the interests of minority communities and council decision making enshrined in the Local Government Act Northern Ireland 2014 apply to all decisions by the new councils, including those taken during the shadow period. Many of these decisions will establish the framework and ethos within which a council will operate once it takes on its full responsibilities from the 1st of April next year. Taking this commitment into account, Section 41 of the Act, which makes provision for members to request the reconsideration or call-in of a Council decision in specified circumstances, was brought into, co -op into operation by commencement order from the 2nd of June this year and is therefore available to members of a new Council during the shadow period. Section 41 also requires the Council to make provision in its standing orders to require the Clerk to the Council to obtain the opinion of a practising barrister or solicitor where the call-in has been requested on the grounds that the decision would disproportionately affect adversely any section of the inhabitants of the district. Section 37 of the Act, which also came into operation on the 2nd of June, places a duty on the Council to make standing orders for the regulation of the proceedings and business of the Council. Therefore, during the shadow period, a Council is under statutory duty to make provision for the call-in procedure. In addition, the local government regulations specify that the Council's standing orders must include provision that a qualified majority is required in relation to a Council's decision on a call-in made on the ground of disproportionate adverse impact. Section 38 provides the Department with an enabling power to specify in regulations those provisions that the Council must incorporate in its standing orders. As I previously indicated during the passage of the Bill in the Assembly, my Department intends that the call-in procedure will be specified in regulations made under Section 38 as a mandatory aspect of the Council's standing orders, which will ensure a consistent procedure across all Councils. And Mr Elliott, for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I, I thank the, uh, the Minister for that very complex uh, answer. And I'm sure everybody has taken in every detail of, of those uh, points. Uh, can the, the Minister advise if there has been any council that he's aware of so far that has used, or shadow council, I should say, that has used the call in procedure? Or has there been any queries through his department and any legal advice sought yet on the procedure? 
and I thank Mr. Elliott for his question and supplementary, albeit a complex <laughs> question. The, the, the supplementary isn't as complex, and nor will the answer be. Uh, you will be relieved to hear. As of yet, no council has officially gone down this route. However, there have been representations and indeed questions from a, a couple of councils regarding particular decisions uh, or even questions as to whether decisions made were decisions or not, let alone could they be called in. Uh, one of those that, that, that springs to mind would be representation from Limavadi Council on uh, the decision around leisure facilities, or sorry, the decision to defer making a decision on leisure facilities and done given. So there have been a couple of queries, but as of yet, there's been no concrete action from any council on this matter, much to my relief. Thank you, and comes to Gregory Campbell. Uh, Deputy uh, Speaker, um, the Minister will be aware that there was a major decision taken in the Londonderry and Straban Council, which uh, surrounded the name of the council which of course had ramifications going back 30 years and all of the consequences that flowed therefrom in terms of community division. Uh, would he be aware that there will inevitably be a call in on that, on those grounds? And what will the outcome be once that call in procedure has been activated? I would like to thank Mr. Campbell uh, for that question. Uh, the major decision to, to, to which he, he refers is one that he may deem controversial. However, I'm not sure how, how many others do. Although, as this legislation and these regulations are around protecting the rights of m m minorities, he may feel that this would warrant a call in. He says that this is inevitable. I have yet to, to hear of any approach made by the Council or any members of the Council. Perhaps they are currently seeking the legal advice that is required before anyone goes down this route. Thank you. And a comment of John Dallet. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer. He has made reference to Limavadi, which of course is only one of two councils that have switched from nationalist control to unionist control. Could I ask the Minister? Could the call-in procedure be used there, where the Causeway Coast and Glens Council decided, in huge controversy, to defer a decision to develop uh, leisure facilities in Dungiven? I thank Mr. Dalit uh, for his supplementary. I had, as he points out, previously made a reference to the decision to which he refers. It's my understanding uh, that Limavadi Council or members thereof are currently seeking legal advice, as is required, to establish whether the decision to defer making a decision qualifies as a decision or not. He quite rightly uh, says that the decision to defer making this decision was controversial and could, in my opinion, have a very detrimental impact not only on leisure provision in the Dungiven area, but also on community relations within that new council area. Thank you. And I call Mr. Uh, order. I call Mr. Mickey Brady. Every quick question five. The HTV road user levy is a UK government tax which was brought in by Westminster on the 1st of April 2014. Whilst I remain concerned and continue to monitor the impact of the levy on hauliers on this island, I believe that my pragmatic decision that the DVA will enforce non-payment of the levy alongside their normal activities will have the least detrimental impact on hauliers. Therefore, I have no plans to reverse this decision. On the 4th of November, the Assembly affirmed my decision by voting down the prayers of annulment against the five statutory rules which provided for domestic enforcement of the levy by fixed penalties. 
The levy has been developed in compliance with EU rules on road user charging. To avoid infraction, the UK Government must ensure that non-payment of the levy is enforced. If DVA were not to enforce the levy, then the Department for Transport would have no option but to introduce their own enforcement regime here in the North. I do not consider that Irish hauliers would benefit from another enforcement agency operating here, as this would significantly increase the chance that they would be delayed en route as a result of encountering multiple roadside checks. In addition to the greater efficiencies that having the DVA enforce the levy would bring, there are financial benefits in terms of staff and equipment resources, which will give the DVA greater flexibility in ensuring the road transport in Northern Ireland is as safe as possible. I call Mr. Mickey Brady for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will know that the HDV levy will have a very negative impact on the North South economy, not least in my own constituency of Newry Armagh. Can I ask the Minister if he has sought to re engage the British and Irish governments to try and achieve an arrangement which reflects the situation on the island of Ireland? Uh, I will ask Concordia and uh, thank Mr Brady for that supplementary question. Uh, this was the subject of a long enough debate last week and I do fully recognise, I suppose coming from a border constituency myself, the potential impact that this levy can have on cross-border trade and cross-border traders. Prior to making this decision, I engaged in exhaustive uh, correspondence and negotiation with uh, both my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland and the Department for Transport in London with a view to initially avoiding introduction of the levy here and uh, then moved on to seeking exemptions around particular routes. The A5 is one with particular relevance uh, to my own constituency and that of others. I did secure from the Department of Transport from Minister <clears throat> Robert Goodwill an assurance, a commitment that this will be monitored. And if we are able to, if Mr Brady is able to, or if the hauliers themselves are able to provide evidence of the detrimental impact or of any detrimental impact being caused by this levy to their business, that the decision or the enforcement and implementation of the levy here in the north could be reviewed. I'm going to call Ms Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, following on from the um, suspiciously long debate last week on this particular issue, could the Minister um, outline what action the Department for Transport at Westminster would do if this Assembly had not um, approved the regulations to enforce the road user levy. Good morning, I thank uh, Mrs Cameron for that question. As outlined in my initial answer uh, to Ms. Mr Brady, had I not decided to proceed with enforcement of the levy here through the DVA Department for Transport due to EU regulation and rather than face EU infractions would have no option other than to come here and enforce the levy themselves. I indicated at the debate and again today the fact that by having one agency doing that, a local agency doing that, it could actually work and should actually work and will actually work to the advantage of these hauliers rather than having multiple agencies carrying out roadside checks that would lead to delays, which would inevitably and definitely have a detrimental impact on the, the business of hauliers. We were able to secure from uh, DFT funding, which will uh, enable us to provide three additional jobs within DVA to enforce this levy, and also three quarters of a million pounds, which can be spent on automatic number plate recognition cameras that will go that can be used not just for around levy enforcement but also help uh, DVA 
with uh, their other checks that they have to do to ensure the roadworthiness and safety of vehicles using our roads here in the north. Thank you. Um, that ends the period for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the, the Minister uh, to outline his commitment to the protection and development of the built heritage? I uh, thank Mr. Eastwood for that question. The built heritage of Derry, as Mr. Eastwood well known, is a key selling point for the city, both in the attraction of visitors and the encouragement of inward investment. It is also a, a key focus of pride for residents, and that is why I am committed to ensuring that important work to realise its full potential continues into the future. Over the past 10 years, and I hear Mr. Wilson call in there, but he will remember. Over the past 10 years, my department has worked in partnership with Derry City Council and other key stakeholders on a range of built heritage projects in the city. This has included delivery of the Walled City Signature Project, focusing on the conservation of the walls and six key buildings, including the Guild Hall. We have also worked with the Foyle Civic Trust and the Heritage Lottery Fund to deliver the Townscape Heritage Project. And we also provided assistance to Angelaris and the Inner City Trust to purchase and conserve two very important listed buildings. My department is also working with partners to build upon the efforts of 2013 to offer events focused upon the city's heritage and increase awareness. It delivered an Archaeology Days event in June and a strong celebration of the city's built heritage focused upon European Heritage Open Days in the summer. Of course, a key area of action is in the processing of applications for planning permission, listed building consent and conservation area consent. And I am committed to ensuring that my department continuously seeks high standards of design and protects the special architectural and historic character of the city's buildings and areas throughout this process. Mr. Eastwood, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you. And can I thank the, the Minister for, for his uh, answer? Um, I take it the Minister will agree with me that the work done around the built heritage, the protection and, and, and supporting of it, has got a very beneficial economic benefit to uh, our city. And can he uh, further give a commitment, even in these uh, is he able to, in these uh, economically straitened times, to give a commitment to, the, to continue in that work and to ensure that we have the protection of the built heritage and the economic spin-off uh, as a result of that? I uh, thank Mr Eastwood for that supplementary. He touches on the economic benefit uh, that can be generated through investment in the built heritage, and that is something that cannot be denied. It's been evidenced that for every one pound spent by the department uh, on built heritage, be it restoration or renovation of listed buildings, a further seven pounds from other sectors is attracted. This is of major benefit to any area, but particularly an area like Derry, where I suppose other economic opportunities are so unfortunately sparse. I can give a commitment that I do and will remain committed to the built heritage in Derry. However, given the, the, the swinging cuts of a budget, I cannot stand here and say that the commitment that has been given by the Department over recent years can be maintained. That is something that causes me great concern. It will cause great concern to people, not just in Derry, but right across the north, those with an interest in built heritage, and those that see the, the economic driver that our built heritage has become and is. Thank you. And I call Mr John Dallet. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I am sure the Minister would agree the coming of Christmas is topical, and I am just wondering what kind of goodwill and prosperity has been extended to the former DVA workers in Coleraine who are now about to run out of the temporary work that was given by DSD. Uh, could the Minister please tell the House what cooperation has he got from other departments and from London to make Christmas perhaps a little bit more hopeful for those people? I thank Mr Dallet. It's a sign of the times, I suppose, that 
Christmas becomes topical as soon as we, we, we reach Halloween. But I understand and sympathise fully with the DVA workers uh, who are in limbo and face great uncertainty. As a result of the DFT decision, 272 DVA licensing staff became surplus. To date, 118 of these staff have been redeployed onto other duties or cleared by other means, for example, promotion or retirement and transfer to DOE posts relocated by myself from Belfast to Coleraine. In total, that was about 50 administration jobs. The DSD ministers, or previous DSD ministers' agreement to temporarily provide work for staff in Coleraine was very much appreciated and helped ensure that over 60 surplus DVA staff had been utilised in the meaningful work on behalf of the Child Maintenance Service since the licensing services ceased at the end of July. However, this work is temporary and will only continue until the end of this year, although already the staff or the complement of staff required for this work has begun to reduce. And having written the Minister Story on this uh, just last week, he has informed me that there is no scope for DSD to transfer any further work to Coleraine on a permanent or temporary uh, basis. One, I suppose, glimmer of, of light or hope for the, the staff there is a guarantee or an assurance that I have received from DVLA in Swansea that they will uh, contribute significantly to uh, an early exit scheme for workers. It's a geographically limited one, and it, but it's not limited to these DVA staff and could free up and should free up positions in the civil service and in and around the North West to which they can transfer. I, call Mr. For a I thank the uh, Minister for his answer and commend him for the uh, strenuous efforts he has made uh, to alleviate the plight of those wonderful people in Coleraine. I have to say, though, in my supplementary, I'm extremely disappointed he hasn't been able to report greater cooperation from other government departments. Could the Minister perhaps update us on what the present situation is in, in terms not just of the jobs, but because but because of the services, because my indication is that there are horrendous problems. I thank Mr. Dalit for that supplementary and his recognition of the battle, I suppose, fought by myself and my predecessor, uh, Minister Atwood, to retain these jobs, which wasn't just about protecting the public servants, but it was about protecting the public service, a high-quality public service that people here in the north had come to expect. Sadly, since uh, the transfer to Swansea, there has, without doubt, been a diminution of that uh, service, and that has manifested itself, I'm sure, in many representations to me and, and calls to me from other members of this House and councils, uh, uh, councillors across the north representing constituents who are encountering difficulties uh, in Swansea. I have followed this up uh, continuously with uh, Minister Goodwill, and I have to say that in response to a letter to Minister Goodwill, I got a letter from Claire Perry, MP. She has replied to me recently confirming that she was aware that there were issues with what they deem a small number of, of records, reassuring me that these would be rectified as a matter of priority. DVLA have since stated at official level that the initial teething problems have largely been rectified and any issues identified with individual records are being dealt with through a normal line of business. I had also provided a special hotline for elected members to Swansea should they have any particularly, particular constituent uh, complaints. And while they do contend that most of these issues have been rectified, I do think that is reflected in uh, a reduction in the amount of correspondence I'm getting on these issues. Thank you. I call Ms. Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. On a, on a similar theme to question one around built heritage, could I ask the Minister what measures he's taking to ensure that NIEA owned property is as accessible as possible to the public? I thank Ms. McElveen for her question. 
As outlined in my earlier answer to uh, Colum Eastwood, I fully appreciate and recognise the value of our built heritage, to, uh, not just as part of our uh, rich tourism product, but also as something to be cherished and enjoyed by residents here. It's my intention to ensure that our built heritage assets remain as accessible as they have become over recent years to tourists, to, uh, to locals alike. There was, however, a decision I had to make during the summer due to unforeseen uh, budgetary uh, cuts that resulted in me having to reduce staffing at some of these uh, assets. I, a lot of the staff employed at these locations are done so on a temporary or seasonal basis, and some had to be let go a couple of weeks earlier than they would normally have been. However, by shifting around the workforce within the NIEA, I have uh, managed to address any of those problems, and hopefully they will be back, back on full throttle come next summer. I call Ms. Michael Veen for supplementary. Thank you, and, and I thank the minister for his for his answer. But I mean, it is disappointing as a as an, a Strangford MLA, you know, to see built heritage such as um, Scrabble Tower, which is, has closed quite recently, along with um, Newtonards Priory, Carcass and Castle, which I've written to to the minister on, and, and other striking historical structures which have been closed for, for many years um, to the public, um, and they could draw additional tourists to those areas. I really would like to know what steps the Minister is taking to ensure that these are open and tied into a tourism strategy that will benefit the people working and living, particularly in my own constituency. I uh, thank Ms McElveen for that supplementary. With reference to Scrabble Tower in particular, I have gone to some effort to ensure that it is uh, reopened. The correspondence case to which she, she re refers, I have not yet uh, got, got round uh, to replying to, but I will in, in the near future. And I'm sure that it will reflect what I'm saying here again today, that I am committed to exploring any option available to us as a department or the NIEA as an agency to ensure that these facilities can be opened and that we can maximise the benefits of these uh, assets to the local community. Thank you. And I call Mr. Marcino Mueller. Uh, I wanted to thank the Minister for his intervention in uh, providing emergency compensation payments to families in South Belfast who were devastated by the floods of uh, 16th of October. Uh, and I wanted to ask, uh, do, could he provide me with a, a figure for the number of compensation payments made in South Belfast? And of course, not only on 16th of October, but much worse floods of 2012. I don't know if the compensation scheme existed before that but perhaps going back uh, in the two previous floods over the last 10 years. Uh, yes, Kim Collier, and I thank uh, Mr O'Muller for his question and welcome him to uh, the Assembly. Uh, in October, heavy rainfall resulted in flooding and properties in South Belfast. The member, of course, is well aware of that. I'm sure he was up to his eyes in it, or at least to his knees. And I activated the scheme of emergency financial assistance, which allowed residents affected by flooding to apply through their local council for the £1,000 emergency grant. This practical assistance is only available to those who have suffered severe inconvenience to help make their homes habitable as quickly as possible. With regards to the previous floods a few years ago, I do not have figures there it predated my time in office, but with the more recent flooding in October, I understand that some 35 homes in South Belfast were affected and were entitled to the £1,000 payment. And I'm sorry, I don't have time for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. And uh, we will now move on to.